is. Okay. So uh, welcome to uh, version eight of Let's Talk. Today we'll be talking about coping skills uh, for cabin fever. Carolyn McVicker is there as well as Abby Horton. I am Dr. Josh Iyer. I'm an assistant professor in the Capstone College of Nursing and you're gonna have extra nursing today, which is actually good because I'm not a nurse, I'm a psychologist, you see. There I do research in integrated behavioral health and opioid treatment and LGBTQA plus health. And I have with me an actual nurse, <laughs> Abby Horton. Uh, she's my colleague in the Capstone College of Nursing. Uh, she's on the, she's some of the teaching faculty. She's a certified, certified evidently, you're double certified there, Abby. I just did that for you. <laughs> Holistic health and life coach. Uh, she's been a Wellbama ambassador. I don't know if you are right now. Are you still awesome? So she is a Wellbama ambassador. She's active in the Alabama State Nurses Association, and she is pursuing a doctorate in nurse education. I know this firsthand because I was one of her instructors a couple of semesters back. She does hold her master's in nursing, especially uh, with a focus on rural case management, and she has three degrees from UA that masters as well as two bachelors in nursing and political science. So our topic today is a little bit more of a fun take on all of the stuff we've been going through. What is cabin fever? So we're talking about coping with cabin fever. And uh, I think this is well-timed because of all of the topics, uh, I've seen the most evidence of cabin fever cropping up in the last couple of weeks. So, so maybe this is the right, right exact topic for the right moment. Um, so it's defined by Merriam-Webster as extreme irritability and restlessness from living in isolation or a confined indoor area for a prolonged period of time. And none of us know what that's about, do we? So, sorry, adjusting my screen here. Okay, so fun fact, this uh, term cabin fever actually comes from a 1918 novel, which is right when the Spanish flu was hitting, the last huge epidemic that the US dealt with. Um, but based on my research, it's not actually related to the Spanish flu. It emerged from the West in the United States where people had to go a long time without seeing each other. The title of the 1918 novel Cabin Fever by B.M. Bauer references the term then widely used in the American West to denote the restless feeling of being cooped up too long in a cabin all winter. A synonym for cabin fever is shanty fever. I guess that's a class difference. Now, on the other hand, the terms hill, uh, nutty, and bushy refer to being out in the wilderness for long periods of isolation. As we've previously discuss discussed, stir crazy derives from, from stir an old word that means prison. So now you know way more of those terms than you ever needed to know. Okay, so what cabin fever is not, at least for our purposes, it is not horror movies, although we're living it. And uh, it is also not a movie. Uh, there's no place like not at home, click, 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 piles of toilet paper in the corner. I thought that was a great cartoon. So what is cabin fever? What are we talking about today? Cabin fever is not a formal diagnosis. It's a common reaction to being isolated or confined for an extended period of time. And it is absolutely, all you have to do is go on social media and you know that many of us are dealing with this right now. It's not the same experience for everyone, but many people report feeling intensely irritable or restless. And all you have to do is look at Facebook comments and you'll know this is happening. So some of the other effects that people report are lethargy, which is feeling like you have no energy, sadness or depression, trouble concentrating, lack of patience, food cravings, decreased motivation, difficulty waking, frequent napping, and hopelessness. And if you've been tuning in to multiples of these Let's Talk webinars, then you know that we have been dealing with all of these things as we've gone through. Um, so today we're sort of going to do a review a little bit of some of the things we've talked about and uh, add in some new information. And then at the end, my expert, Abby Horton, is going to answer your questions from her experience about different ways of dealing with cabin fever and things we can do to be less irritable and restless, especially with the ones we love. 
So Abby found this cool video I'm gonna play for y'all. Awesome. I wish I could whoa, move forward. Okay. I wish I could uh, create presentations that were that awesome with those happy little sound tracks and sound effects. I would feel uh, much better at doing this if I could do that too. But what I can do is recap for you. So the seven tips that they talked about in the video were positively reframing your negative thoughts trying to create a daily routine because and, and these are things that we talked about so um, creating a daily routine so that you can sort of keep that pacing to your day now that our routines are all messed up. Try to get moving, keeping yourself active, finding a creative outlet, so doing something artistically with your hands or with color or music, celebrating virtually, focusing on what, and we talked earlier about people who are doing these car parades to celebrate people's birthdays where they're waving from the car. There are really creative ways that people are finding to celebrate with each other, even though they can't do it in the ways they used to, big crowds. Uh, number six was focus on what you can do. And that's always a good tip. And number seven is take care of your mental health. So we're gonna be talking a little bit more about ways to do this. Y'all may remember from one of the, from the first Let's Talk, uh, we went over the face COVID pamphlet and it involved a lot of uh, strategies or a good strategy to help with a lot of these things we were talking about. So it can help you with uh, irritability and taking care of your mental health and uh, uh, helping your, you to cope with the negative thoughts and things that can come to mind. You'll remember that it, the face COVID was an acronym and it stood for focus on what's in your control acknowledge your thoughts and feelings, come back into your body and engage in what you're doing. And then it involves committed action, opening up values, identity resources, and then of course, disinfecting and distancing to stay away from people who might have the virus or the virus itself. All right, so some other tips. Um, this is one that I've noticed a lot of people doing. Uh, this is actually my garden. You can't see it, it's back there, but it's there. Uh, this is the first garden I've had in probably 20 years. <laughs> but you never know what kind of access you'll have to fresh vegetables in a pandemic and it gets my hands in the dirt and gets me able to do something where I can't think so much. So all good things. Then also a lot of my friends have talked to me about hiking, uh, even going by themselves. One of my friends yesterday was telling me about uh, driving two and a half hours to go hike in these places that she's always wanted to see or heard about, but that she's never had the time to go to. And now she does. And uh, it's giving her this time uh, to herself, but also away from home. Getting away from home matters if you're feeling the effects of cabin fever. But there are lots of ways of doing this, just like I'm doing right now, finding ways to do some of your meetings outdoors, feel some fresh air, get some sunlight. Hopefully I'm not like whiting out here on the video for y'all, the sun. I thought it would be more overcast than it is, but I'm loving being outside. 
Okay, other tips, get your body moving maintain, and maintain a healthy diet. So y'all may remember from um, one of the Let's Talks that we talked about diet and exercise. And anybody who's a parent recognizes that you get a lot of exercise chasing your kids. I'll try to chase them around the yard instead of just around the house. It might feel better. And then also a friend of mine does yoga outside as a way to both get outside and get moving. I've found that I've had to be really intentional in the last uh, couple of months about making sure I do something active every day or I don't. Um, I think it was yesterday, I'm writing a grant right now, and yesterday I looked down at my watch at five o'clock and I'd only gone uh, 1,200 steps the whole day. So I went out and I walked around the block for a little bit. Um, it's really easy to do that when we don't have to go to work and we don't have to walk to our car or anything like that. So think about trying to do something every day to get your body moving. Another one is carve out some quiet time. Uh, this is a really important time to make sure you're giving yourself time to reflect on yourself, to calm down, to not be thinking about things that might make you anxious. Uh, in one of the Let's Talks, we talked about uh, sleep and being able to carve out some quiet time and, and calm yourself down is a really important part of sleep. Um, meditation is a good way to, to quiet down. This awesome photo of this kid reading a book. We go out in the backyard and read. Uh, I think you can see my hammock, but when I can, I get over into the hammock and do some reading. It's usually research articles, but it's still outside reading. Uh, take your coffee outside. It's a lot easier to do now than it is when we have to run to work. So go out in the backyard with your coffee and enjoy a minute. I'm trying to do that every morning now. Or take a nice bath. Again, like things that you can do at home to sort of get away. Uh, I like this idea, redecorate or rearrange your space based on the number of people you see at Lowe's or Home Depot or the number of complaints I see on social media about the number of people at Lowe's. A lot of people are doing home repair projects right now or rearranging their spaces. When I was uh, taking a walk around the neighborhood the other day, I saw that one of my neighbors has completely renovated their entire outdoor area. So they now have this gorgeous patio and their garage is clean and organized. And I thought, good coping. And wow, like that's gonna be a really good long-term change that person has used this time for. So think about doing that. A uh, couple of buckets of paint can also brighten your room, make it feel fresh again when you've been in there for a while. And then I'm sure Abby's gonna give some more advice about this, but I ran across this resource about in indoor activities that you can do with kids to help burn energy. And you can see from these pictures that this is a lot of activities. And I thought 87 is enough that you'll find one you can get away with. A number of them seemed to involve tape, using tape on the floor. So I guess that might be a concern, but you can find out a, a way around that. But uh, check that link out if that sounds good to you. And then finally, if all else fails, just try to remember and that cabin fever isn't forever. Even when you have to stay at home, you're not feeling cabin fever all of the time, so that feeling will pass. And then eventually we'll all be getting out again and we'll be able to get back to living our lives like we're used to living them. But also we don't have to entirely wait. We can find ways around being safe to still do more. But when all else fails, have a seat, quiet down, and remember that this will pass too. Okay, so let's talk to Abby. What sort of questions do y'all have? Man, I rolled through that quickly. What sort of questions do y'all have uh, for Abby? You can enter your questions in the chat box um, or ask a question. And uh, I've got a couple of questions too that I'll ask uh, if we don't have um, anyone answering uh, quickly. So Abby, um, I know that you've got kids. And I know that you've got a job. <laughs> I know that you're really busy with lots of other things. So how are you handling all this right now? How are you keeping yourself from having cabin fever? And how are you helping your kids not to? Well, sure. That, that's so much to even try to summarize in a couple of sentences. But um, I think day to day is how I'm handling 
COVID-19 and all the changes that it's brought to our world because every day is so different. It's, it's a lot of the same <laughs> every day, but there's always a new challenge every day too. Um, so I'm a mom of five. I have two sets of twins. And so my kids are ages uh, 12, 10, and almost eight. We are about to have some birthdays coming up. So, um, you know, for every season of life, you know, with young children, it's going to vary. So, um, you know, if you've got older kids that want to be socializing with their friends, you're going to have a different set of challenges. If you've got, you know, toddlers or babies in diapers, then your life is going to look a little bit different than mine right now. But I think uh, as a parent trying to work and trying to manage, you know, Zoom calls and, and, and work and kids, that can be really challenging. So I would say if you're, you know, not able to always get outside and have some relaxation time, or maybe you're not the person who has the time to redo their patio, <laughs> give yourself some grace. Because I think that's what I see with my, my friends who are working in parenting. Uh, you know, I'm hearing that guilt of, you know, we, we don't feel like we have more time right now. We actually feel like we have a little less time where, you know, we're not getting to do all of the fun things that um, some of our other friends are posting on social media who maybe have a different season of life going on right now. So I would say just remember that your situation is unique and, you know, every day you might have a great day today, but tomorrow I may not be so great. And just remember, like you said earlier, that this will pass and um, this is not going to be our reality forever. That's good advice, Abby. So uh, for those of you who are in the room, and I know there are a bunch of people in the room, what are your challenges right now? What are the things that you find yourself struggling with a little bit? This is me watching for your questions. <laughs> <laughs> Abby, do you have any advice for people who are feeling that irritability that I was talking about? I, I have seen a lot of it on Facebook. I found myself in a couple of uh, conversations in the last week where I was like, whoa, 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 why is this person angry at me? I don't even understand what they're complaining about. And, you know, it, it seems like people are just sort of popping off without even realizing that they're doing it. Yeah, I do think, and I'm sure you agree, that social media sometimes, um, particularly when there's a crisis going on or changes going on, can be our source of uh, venting our frustrations or it can be an outlet. And uh, especially when we're behind a computer screen or a phone screen, it can feel really easy to vent frustrations or share emotions that we wouldn't necessarily if we were in person. And so I think having the, the recognition of am I feeling frustrated, you know, checking in with yourself. And that's something that I have to do regularly because, you know, all five of my children are so different. And having that many kids has really taught me a lot about you can live in the same household and have some really similar experiences, but then that can play out very differently with personalities. And so um, it's always a great reminder when I look at my kids, you know, we have the very similar days, <laughs> but very different reactions to certain you know, challenges in our days. And so I think giving yourself grace, but also taking time to check in and realize that, you know, maybe we need to take a break or maybe we don't need to check in with social media or maybe we don't need to check in with the news quite as often. And I think journaling helps that, you know, getting to know yourselves um, and really thinking about how you cope with crisis. You know, for some people, they've experienced trauma or a crisis before in their lives. And so, They've got a really good tool set, you know, a skill set to really draw on. And, um, you know, they realize maybe this is not the hardest thing that they've ever been through. But for some of us, you know, we haven't had those sorts of challenges. And so we're having to develop a new skill set. So I think reflective journaling, checking in, taking breaks from social media, taking breaks from the news are all really good ways to start to, to really think about how to handle our emotions a little bit more effectively and maybe not get into so many heated conversations on social media. Yeah, and the questions are rolling in, Abby, so I'll be reading these to you. Uh, right. But I forgot when I introduced you to tell everybody that you are also a Whalebama presenter and <laughs> you do the Sleep and Stress series with me. And uh, you do some other talks on your own too, don't you? I do, yes. Yeah. There, we did about 21 uh, classes last year. 
for the fall and the spring, which was a lot of fun. I really enjoyed that. So yeah. Thanks. Abby's great. If y'all haven't seen her, you need to check out some of her talks. Um, so Abby, the first question I have here is, um, how do you encourage yourself uh, in uncertain times? And uh, Stephanie was asking, especially like daily, on a daily basis, how do you, you keep yourself encouraged? <laughs> Yeah, I think that's going to look different for everyone depending on, um, you know, your personal preferences. But for me personally, I really like to check in with some social, you know, media influencers that have a really positive attitude and who aren't necessarily talking about the COVID-19 pandemic. They're just talking about everyday life and everyday challenges that you might have. And so a couple of my favorites would be, of course, Brene Brown, who is a really well-known social worker. I think that she always has some great things to share. And she certainly does talk about current events, but she really does it in a positive way. I really like Mel Robbins, and she does a lot of in inspirational and motivational work, uh, particularly around mental health. And they both have websites and, you know, social media accounts that are easy to follow. And then I just try to check in with people in my life who are really positive and encouraging and who know me on a personal level. So, you know, I might hit two or three people to reach out to in the morning when I have an opportunity. So I might text my best friend or I might text a coworker or I might reach out to one of my family members. And that's always a good source of motivation and positivity. So if I need some of that love and some of that support and encouragement, then I just give it to other people. And then inevitably, either from them or someone else, it will bounce back to me. And so those are a couple of simple ways that I do that just really quickly in the morning. You know, a five minute video, um, an Instagram post that I might read, or just a quick text message that I might send. I uh, hope that I, answers your question. <laughs> I, I, I really like that, Abby, uh, a, a number of the things you said. Um, I want to second what you said about Brene Brown. One of the things that I like about Brene Brown is that her advice is all evidence based. She's an awesome researcher and has done tons of research to back up. Um, what she talks about. And, and I think what's really interesting is she came at it from a very negative place. Mm -hmm. She's very encouraging now, but her initial research was all about shame and guilt and these really negative feelings we have. But as she learned more about them, she learned techniques on how to get past that. Mm -hmm. um, one of the things from my perspective is that I also like about Brene Brown is she's not like 100% positive all the time. She's <laughs> really good about letting, letting you know about like her own struggles with being a human and having bad days and bad moments. And for me, one of the things I find really helpful is this idea that comes from stoicism, which I was talking about this too shall pass. It's a good, it's a good one. Um, for good and bad. And a lot of people think that um, embracing that idea, that mindset means that you're not really enjoying good times when they happen mm -hmm. so that you cannot enjoy or not you know, suffer in bad times. Mm -hmm. But it's not like that. It's more of an awareness that when you're having a good time, really cherish it because good times will pass. Mm -hmm. And when you're having a bad time, like recognize that it will pass too. Mm -hmm. um, one of the pieces of advice I give people is it will definitely get worse, but it might get way better before then. <laughs> right? like, there's always going to be life going back and forth and the balance to life. Um, so I find that can be helpful too, just to like, like you said, like be loving with yourself when you're having a bad day, when, when you're not feeling that, that encouragement, just sort of recognize like, okay, this will pass too. And maybe go watch some Brene Brown for a little bit. Or was it Mel Robbins? Is that who you said? I, I do like Mel Robbins. I like Brene. It just depends on what mood you're in, which one I will turn to. But Yeah, um, I don't know Mel Robbins, so I'm going to have to look Mel Robbins up. It's very similar. If you like Brene, I always tell people you, you would probably like Mel Robbins. Awesome. Um, she so we'll um, recently, Dr. Brene Brown, she said that joy is like twinkle lights. That they that joy is not constant, but it's like twinkle lights that you know it comes and then it goes and then it comes again, and um, you know I think that's so true because without having the absence of joy, you know I don't know that we would appreciate those happy moments like you were saying. So yeah, there's so many good things that you can pull from her research, and I do love that she's 
really real and raw and you can see uh, her human qualities. <laughs> her human qualities. Yeah. <laughs> okay, so um, I have a number of questions coming in from different, uh, different uh, places. So, um, so another one was about finding quiet time. How do you find quiet time? And by that, I'm sure we mean, how do you make quiet time? <laughs> yes, you don't really find time. I don't think uh, for, for much of anything, I think you have to carve it out. Um, but I say that all the time too. I need to find time for that. Um, and then I have to remember, actually, I need to make time. I need to schedule it. And so, you know, so many of us are probably not using our planners. I still am. I think there's value in still having that structure, like you mentioned earlier, structure is so important because our brains, you know, number one job, I feel like, um, you know, is to really protect us. And so our brains like to know what to expect. And so I think having structure is still important, especially if you have a family, um, even our pets, you know, our dog, I think is very upset right now that we're home all the time. I think we're interrupting his life. But um, even, you know, our pets like to have structure and, and like to know what to expect. And so I think, you know, scheduling your days as if you're really, you know, having a, a traditional work day is important. It may not have times associated with it, but maybe you have rhythms of what you do every day. And so maybe you need to get up a little bit early. I know for me, the, you know, the kind of, I don't know, the fallback is that, since we're not commuting, I can sleep an hour later. That's kind of what I started out with. And then I realized I probably just need to go ahead and get up at my usual time and just have that time be quiet time, or maybe I need to get my workout in before my workday starts. And so I think it just depends on your schedule and how you want to adjust and, you know, whether you have people depending on you, whether it's plants or pets or little people. Um, but yeah, just find a moment that works for you and it may not be scheduled, but if you have a few minutes and, you know, a Zoom call gets canceled or, you know, something changes in your day, then definitely go off of your planner and, and take that time for yourself. But sometimes I think we try to rush through thinking we're going to clear our calendar, we're going to clear our schedule, we're going to clear our workload, and there's always something else kind of waiting in the wings. And so, um, we don't ever stop to take time for ourselves because we think we're going to eventually catch up. And I don't think that's how work works anymore. <laughs> so just stop and know, okay, I, I need to take a few minutes. I need to walk around the, the park. You know, I need to walk around the neighborhood. I need to go sit on my back porch. And if you have little kids or kids that need more of your attention, then I think having them be involved in that is really important too. So you have a project, if you can have them count paper clips, if you can have them take something to the, you know, office space for you, just include them so that they get more of that intentional time because work and life kind of bleed into each other when we're doing it all at home. That's, that's good advice. I, I especially like the idea of like um, thinking right now about taking advantage of the time you have to do things with your loved ones. So, yeah, I think one of the things that gets really frustrating with kids is when they get bored, they mm -hmm. feel like they don't have anything to do. Mm -hmm. So if they're in that really unpleasant place of feeling so bored that they might be willing to help you do something <laughs> that they wouldn't normally do. Exactly. Uh, but at the very least, you're, you're doing things together. Uh, well, so I want to say something about that because that's a great mm -hmm. point. You know, I think today I'm in my early, early to mid thirties. And so I think that that's helpful for you to know because that gives you my perspective. But here it's today, I feel like we, we have this sense that kids shouldn't be bored. And I think it's really okay for kids to be bored. My kids tell me that they're bored. And so I tell them to go find something to do because I think that uses their imagination and their creativity. And um, the other thing is, is that when they come to me and I've offered them suggestions and they still are talking about being bored, then I tell them if they come back to me that I'm going to find them something to do. And it's usually a cleaning task or a project that I need help with. And then suddenly they're no longer bored. <laughs> and so I just want to tell anyone who feels like that they are kind of acting as a cruise ship director for their children, that it's okay. okay. Give yourself permission to not do that because I don't think that we had parents that probably had our days scheduled out with, with fun, cool 
you know, activities all the time and we turned out great and, and we're able to occupy our times pretty good. And so I think that parents probably just need to lower their expectations and that pressure. Yeah, I, I think we all need to lower our expectations right now. Uh, so there's a, a follow-up question um, about, uh, you were saying that you want to wake up at the same time and, and do your stuff. And um, the last speaker we had on said, eh, take it easy, like get up later if you want to. And um, I wanted to bring that up, that it's really about what you want to do. I, for my part, have uh, been getting up at four or five in the morning still every morning and working on my computer until normal workday starts. Um, <laughs> And I thought I would get away from that, but I still get up that early to get away from email. And email doesn't stop. Mm -hmm. And so it's, it's been interesting that, you know, I've slept in some, but for me sleeping in some is like eight o'clock, you know? So I, I have been doing that a little bit, but I found that like that immediate startup of the work right after I get up through email is, is so unpleasant that I, I prefer to actually mm -hmm. uh, get up earlier like I was. Um, I think we're yeah, very but, similar in that. And I think it's really individual because I do like to get ahead of things. If I sleep in late, then I sleep in late with five kids ready to eat breakfast or I sleep in late to an email inbox full of, of things that are already needing my attention or time. And so I just don't like starting out the day being what I feel like is behind even though I can catch up. So there are days that I do sleep in, but I also try to go ahead and at least get up earlier than the workday starts. So earlier than eight, because after that, I'm going to feel behind. Right. But there's no right way, you know, in air quotes, there's no right way to do COVID-19 and work from home. It's just whatever works for you. But I think that most people do better at least sticking to the same routine. <laughs> So that they're being consistent. Yeah. And so what I you. say about, oh, I'm sorry. Yeah. Just, I said, just do what works for you. You know, don't compare yourself to others because you don't have the same life. <laughs> right. And so I, uh, and I think that's what Bobby was getting at too last time um, was just this, uh, you know, be flexible, like mm -hmm. let things be a little different now. Mm -hmm. Let, let things look a little different now. Um, and about schedules and routines, I, I agree with you. Schedules and routines are, are really valuable for lots of ways. And you're the boss of that. <laughs> like if the routine doesn't work that day, just don't do it that day. But it is, I think, useful and healthy, especially to kids and animals and, and ourselves. I think if we have some sort of expectation for a routine, even if we end up deviating from that even regularly. Absolutely. Okay, so um, I mentioned email. We talked about email. There are a number of dig questions about digital stuff. Um, I find myself struggling, Brandy sent this. I find myself struggling with what you mentioned about working all day and realizing that I didn't move from in front of the computer for very long. Are there any recommended uh, or recommendations for or data on the maximum screen time you should have and needed breaks every so many minutes? Well, in terms of, you know, of children, they usually say between, you know, 30 minutes to less than two hours for, you know, young children, elementary school age and below. And I think that that's a great recommendation for anyone. And so, you know, has my screen time looked like I've been on the phone all day? Because I use my phone for everything. I think it's, you know, our, our many computers that are always in our back pocket. Uh, so yeah, I definitely have used my phone too much and I have to check myself. As much as I check my screen time and my steps, you know, I've got to check the other. <laughs> and so, um, you know, if my screen time's up, then my steps are probably down. But I think it's important to give ourselves grace because we're trying to, you know, navigate uncharted waters. And sometimes, you know, and back to the Brene Brown piece, we numb out and it's so easy to numb out on Instagram or Pinterest or Twitter or Facebook. And it, it's, it's a fun, seemingly harmless way to, to really distract ourselves or entertain ourselves. And we all, oftentimes will say that we're going to be on there for a few minutes and then, you know, it's a rabbit trail <laughs> that we go down. And so I think setting, you know, parameters, checking in to see how often you are moving your body, see how often you are on your phone. 
Um, and this question from Russell in the chats about how do we distance ourselves from social media? And I think one way to do that is, um, you know, to delete the apps from our phones, because if it's not readily available, you know, we oftentimes will find something else to do. It's just like with eating, um, you know, unhealthy snacks. If they're not in our pantries, it's a lot harder to then go and eat that when we're trying to just, you know, mindlessly eat or, or feel a little bit better by having a snack. And so I think distancing yourself really looks like deleting the apps or hiding them in a folder if mm -hmm. it's really, you know, disruptive to your day. Uh, I think you can put, you know, parameters on there with the limit your time apps and the settings that you have, you know, on smartphones, you can put that you only want to be on social media for an hour. And those are some things that you can start with, but I think addressing the underlying need is where you really need to start because you can do a workaround. You can download the app back on your phone. You can change the settings. You know, if you don't address the underlying emotion, which is, you know, I need a break or, mm -hmm. um, you know, I'm feeling stressed out. I want to kind of numb out with Instagram then you're, you're probably going to go find something else. You're going to go find a carby snack or you're going to go, you know, do something else that may not be productive either. And so just giving yourself grace, acknowledging, you know, I'm feeling really sad right now or I'm feeling really disconnected right now. You know, what's a good way for me to feel connection or what's a good way for me to feel productive and address that emotion. And then if you want to go scroll social media for 20 minutes, then, then give yourself the grace and the time to go do that. And then, Set an alarm. If you've got an alarm on your watch or your phone, or maybe you have an Echo Dot, you know, put that timer on. And when that timer goes off, then switch gears. And, um, you know, just don't feel badly about what you have to do right now in this season to cope, to cope well, because I think we all have those moments where we have days where we, we feel badly about how much time we were on the screens or how many steps we didn't get. But we're not posting that usually on social media. <laughs> we're only posting the highlights. Well, I wouldn't say I post a lot of highlights these days. <laughs> on my social media, I tend to, to be uh, communicating health research to people who are not health researchers, which right now is not, not pleasant. Certainly not highlights. Um, but then I notice sometimes that... Uh, I basically posted a head shaking news <laughs> post where it's just like, this isn't really providing information. It's just all of us get to do this now. <laughs> I probably don't need to do that. Um, I think it's a hard time because right now with social media because I think we're feeling disconnected and isolated and social media feels like it's reconnecting us. Mm -hmm. um, so, you know, I think that it's, it's really important to be strategic like you were saying with social media and uh, one of the things that I've been doing with my FaceTime, which I'm not rationing, I probably should be, but I'm not, but I am rationing how much I'm engaging in stressful conversation and stuff like that. So one of the things I've been doing is finding uh, live music from local musicians who are now all streaming through Facebook Live on YouTube and stuff and watching some of the people that I've seen over the last years, but like basically every night there's a concert and I get to watch, you know, some of my friends like performing and that's a really cool thing. And then in those chats, it's really positive and it's people I know from Tuscaloosa. <laughs> so I, I think that finding things like that to do are, are useful and worthwhile. But if you're just getting on the news and reading all of the bad news right now, like that really needs to be something you put brackets around and you only do for a short amount of time. And when you get on Facebook, like be aware of how much you engage in those conversations. Uh, one of the ways that you can do that with uh, social media accounts is if you have an Android phone, there is an app called Daywise that I just found out about. It's really awesome. It allows you to schedule times of your day where you won't get notifications from certain apps. And then you get them as a batch. So when I'm going to sit down and write for four hours, I have to turn all my notifications off or I will not get the writing done, right? Mm -hmm. so, uh, so that's the kind of thing that you can do. Like you can turn that off for four hours and then you know, not be disturbed by the social media. And then when it's done, brrr, you'll get all your notifications of the things you missed during work. Um, but I have an iPhone and it, they don't have that app. 
for the iPhone. So what I do is I, I've just turned off notifications on Twitter and notifications on Facebook, um, not on text messages though. And so when I get on Facebook or Twitter, it's because I'm intentionally getting on Facebook or Twitter. And I've noticed that that feels a lot better. So that's one thing uh, that you can consider doing. Okay. Do you have other advice about social media? My notifications are also off. My notifications for Facebook have been off for about two years. Mm -hmm. And uh, it takes a little bit of time to get adjusted to that because you're thinking, I wonder if I don't have anything on Facebook today. But then, you know, you get used to just checking in as you, like you said, as you mindfully choose to, um, which is really good. Um, a couple of years ago, they came out with the update from, I think, Facebook, where it showed you how many times you were accessing the app. And that was really surprising, or like how many times you pick up the phone in the morning, you can look at that now with your weekly reports. And, you know, when you look at those numbers, it's just like when you look at your step count, you have to think about, do I really want to be a person who picks up my phone that many times an hour or that many times before I even get out of bed in the morning? And so I definitely use that as a way to check myself and to say, okay, I'm on my phone and I'm not being intentional with it. And so um, Instagram is one that I love. Pinterest is one that I love. There's usually only happy things on there. And usually it's people that I don't know. And so even if it's not happy, I don't feel like it's personal. I don't internalize it. And so I still have my notifications on for that. But with Facebook, that's where I see more of the, um, you know, kind of arguments or the news that's getting republished that you're, you're just feeling a little triggered by. And so for me, that's one that I choose not to interact with as much. But as a mom, there's so much that's connected to Facebook from so much that, you know, even as an employee that's connected to Facebook, I feel like I have to have it, but I just have to choose a different way to interact with it. And so it doesn't have to be all or nothing. Maybe you just turn off notifications during this season at home. Um, but I think it's a good way for you to kind of reevaluate periodically, you know, what do I want my life to look like? Um, and do I want to say that a year from now, when hopefully COVID-19 is a distant memory, how did I spend this time? <laughs> and it's right. probably not on Facebook or in Facebook groups, um, you know, being bombarded with information because every hour, it seems like, especially there in March, every hour something was posted that contradicted something that was posted earlier. And sometimes it was by the same news group or the same folks that were involved in the earlier post. And so, I think if we go back to basics and you just do what you know to do, which is to wash your hands and to use good hygiene and check in once a day to see if there's any important updates. Um, I think that is where you can start to get control of not only your social media, but just your mindset of how you want to approach every day and how you want to approach this time during pandemic. But I do think that it's so important to constantly remind everyone and to remind ourselves that if we don't come out of this pandemic with a new skill or a new hobby or a renovated house or, you know, brilliant children who have learned, you know, a new set of skills, I think that's okay. If we came out with, a, you know, with a new appreciation for the things that maybe we took for granted and a new outlook on life and a better mindset and we maintained what we needed to maintain. I think that that's perfectly reason to celebrate. And um, I feel like there's so many things out on social media that are telling us one extreme or the other, either we should have all of this done or we should just sleep in and, and eat the carbs. <laughs> I, I mean, I, I think that's, that's uh, that sort of chaos in the messaging is, is part of a pandemic. That's what makes pandemics terrible is you end up with, so many people who are irritable and restless <laughs> and figuring out ways to try to vent that. And we've never had an easier way to vent it than Facebook. So I, I find that Facebook right now is full of uh, uh, these really like ugly cesspools of negative emotion. <laughs> I try to avoid uh, really good advice there, Abby. Getting back to Brandy's question, she asked if there were any specific recommendations on max screen time. Did you give a number? I don't know of a specific number. I think for me personally, what I find, if I spend more than an hour or two, either whether it's TV or whether it's, 
you know, my phone, I think that's probably too much. I mean, honestly, you're going to be on your phone probably a lot responding to colleagues or family members because you're not seeing them in person as much. So mm -hmm. I think that it would be reasonable to think that your phone time is going to increase. And certainly your computer time is going to be going to increase because you're doing so much work from home and you're not seeing people. So instead of walking down the hallway and talking to a colleague, you're on the, you know, a Zoom call or you're on email. And so your screen time is going to go up. But if you're just kind of mindlessly, like we all do, scroll social media or scroll emails or what have you, I think more than an hour or two, you're going to feel really depleted from that. But you if you're over, all screen time is up, I think that would be expected during this time. Carolyn, do you know any specific numbers about recommendations on screen time or activity? I, I don't, I don't know. Um, okay. Well, we'll look that up and we'll post that in the comments for it. Uh, I do try to get up and walk around a little bit every hour. Uh, I miss hours sometimes. My Fitbit helps. It gives me a notification about 10 minutes to go in the hour if I haven't moved. So yeah, I, was, I was actually going to mention that we're, we're in a move spring challenge right now for employees. So we do have that option and anybody can use that app to form their own challenges within their friend groups. If you have that, um, if you're in that program and um, it's available for all employees. So that's always something, just a little motivation to help you stay active. Mm -hmm. It helps me. Yeah, that's great. Um, I've, I've been so busy. I didn't notice that that was happening. Uh, I think that kind of social thing too, like that's something we can, we can still do. We can create groups in lots of different ways um, to share with our friends about the experiences we have uh, with exercising. So I mentioned my friend who went hiking. She sent me some photos of that she took while she was hiking and it was gorgeous. And so like, even though I didn't get to go do the hike, um, I did get to share in how pretty it was. And then it made me think, oh, I should go for a hike. Where should I go? Right. So that kind of sharing can be really useful and helpful. Um, making a note about recommendations. What other questions do y'all have or challenges do you have right now? While we're waiting on some more questions, I was going to say for those, and this doesn't have to just be for, for young kids, but for those who just really like to document, many um, you know bloggers and online resources have COVID capsule templates and suggestions for putting a time capsule together. And so I think that would be a really fun way for you to journal some thoughts about this time because a year from now we won't know how we felt, you know, on May 18th, 2020. We'll have a general sense, but you know, involving your family, your friends, your neighborhood, you know, having something together that's just a COVID capsule of this time, I think would be really cool and fun um, to put together. And it might be a way for you to get out, you know, and move, make some steps and maybe document some of this history, because I think it is a really neat time in our, in our history. Um, just as humans, it's a very sad time, but I think it's important to see the good and to celebrate all along the way, even though, um, you know, it's definitely challenging and more so for, for some than others. Yeah. I, and I'm, you know, one of the ways that it's challenging is physically, and, and I want to, you know, comment about this just a little bit. One of the things in our lives that we're normally getting up and moving around a fair amount, I mentioned that earlier, even if it's just getting in the car, walking into our buildings at work, walking through work, so when you spend so much time at home, your body actually reacts to that. And it's probably a good idea to think about every day doing some kind of gentle stretching activity, because I've noticed that my body's gotten really tight just from the lack of normal movement in my day-to-day -day life. Mm -hmm. So we're dealing with some pretty unusual challenges for most of us. But for people who have jobs and stuff that keep them really sedentary, it's not new for them. They know that this is a problem. So that's one of the, the challenges that I've uh, noticed. So anything else? Any other questions or comments from anybody? Abby, can you think of anything else that we should talk about related to cabin fever or Carolyn? You know, I will mention that I think just practicing, I know that my children are all off at college. And so having them home with me right now is important. 
time and I'm really trying to savor the fact that they're here and that we can just sit together on the couch. But um, we are starting uh, to kick off in June, like a 30 day of gratitude um, activity for everybody. And I think that just practicing being grateful and thankful for, for just the simplest things in life is important. And so we've kind of put together um, just different activities and things that you can do each day for 30 days to try to um, be more um, aware of things that you are grateful for. And that's, of course, a pleasant sounding activity. It yes. sounds like who would have a problem with gratitude, right? Mm -hmm. But it's also evidence-based. There is a lot of research to show that um, intentionally focus, focusing on building gratitude mm -hmm. in, by doing activities like that do lead you to have a more positive experience of life. So that doesn't mean that life will be better for you in some sort of magical way. It's actually very practical that you learn to have a more positive approach to the things that are happening around you. So I didn't know you were doing that. That's awesome, Carolyn. And the people who participate in that um, are very likely to see positive benefits from it. And I hope that you all will consider it right here on the talk today. Abby, did you have other things you wanted to mention? I would say, you know, just kind of know what your energy is if you're more introverted or extroverted. I know for those in my house that identify as extroverted, they're struggling a little bit more than the, the typically more introverted people. Although it's a struggle for us too because we're at home with all these people all the time. <laughs> and I'm definitely an introvert. But I have an extroverted child that's used to going somewhere every day. And so never underestimate the power of just getting in the car and driving. She was having a really difficult day yesterday. And so, you know, she got in the car with a parent and rode um, around town for a little while and got to see the sights and kind of did, you know, from the car scavenger hunt, like find something red, find something blue, uh, got a little treat in a drive through and came back home a new person. And so I think never underestimate just getting out and seeing some new, some new scenery and, and doing something simple. It doesn't have to be any, you know, thing grand. It doesn't have to even get you out of the car, but it'll just get you out of the house for a few minutes and um, do those little things, celebrate your small wins and, you know, do all the little things that we've shared throughout these series and in the conversations and just pick what works for you. Treat it like a menu. I think so many times when we think about self-care or we have webinars, we try to do everything so perfectly instead of just taking what is suggested as a menu of options and doing what works for you. Because like I said, everyone has a different life and, and it's going to show up differently how you choose to implement this. And that's what makes it so unique and what makes it so great. I'm so glad you said that because I actually forgot to talk about one of the things I wanted to talk about in the talk today, which is um, a menu of tasks that build pleasure or mastery into your life because we know that both of those things are tied to more positivity. So I will post that for y'all to look at later. Um, but basically it's a list of things and you can make this yourself. Sit down and you get out a pen and paper or do you use your computer or whatever. I've been spending a lot of time recently working with doctoral students who do everything on their computers. So I say, pull out a pen and piece of paper and they look at me like I'm from another planet because increasingly I might as well be from another planet. Um, but you write a list of the things that you really enjoy that when you do them, you feel really good doing them. And that's your pleasure list. Then, you make a list of the things that you're really good at, that when you get done doing that thing, you feel like powerful and competent and confident in yourself. And then wherever you see overlap, you should definitely be doing lots of that. And if you're not, put more of that into your life. And if you have any trouble coming up with those things, that's where these, uh, what I was going to show is good. There, there are these old posters that have been around a while of all sorts of activities that you might enjoy or things that you might do and feel that you're, you're really good at doing them. So I'll put some of those up so that you can get some ideas. But most of us will be able to sit down and come up with a pretty good list right off the bat with that. Um, do y'all have any comments about that? 
That's great. You know, we, um, one of the activities for the 30 days of gratitude is a book of awesome. So it kind of sounds like that uh -huh. little small things in life that really make you think this is so awesome, like ice in your water or just, it could be anything That's but along the same lines, like develop a, a book of awesome. I love yeah. that. That's awesome. <laughs> that's, that's, that would go in my book. Um, so I have a couple of more things that I wanted to mention. Um, one is, uh, th these are two things related to the cabin fever. So I've noticed that uh, Zoom fatigue is really a thing. By Friday, I do not want to see anyone else on a screen. I do not want to participate in another meeting virtually. And I, I really don't want to have to stare at my face anymore, right? Like by Friday, I am really done with Zoom and I'm not the only one. I've noticed that. So be aware of that. That's a thing. And uh, see what you can do to, to manage that. See if, if that's an issue for you. And the other one is I used to go out all the time and, uh, you know, hear music and stuff. And I've discovered that it's not hard for me to stay home when I'm not missing out. Fear of missing out is also a real thing. So some of us might um, might be handling this better than we thought because there's nothing else going on that we're actually missing. But as things start opening up, as uh, some activities start happening, we're really having to make these decisions about, like, is this something I want to do or not? A friend of mine invited me the other day to go on this trip that sounded awesome, but given the the way the numbers look right now, it actually wouldn't have been a very good idea. And it took me two days, <laughs> two days to come to that decision because, uh, you know, it sounded like such a good thing. So in, right now, we really need to be thinking about um, fear of missing out and how that affects our decision making normal times and how that might be affecting our decision making now. Um, it's something I've been thinking about. Do you have any uh, reactions to that? I think that's really important and kind of one of one of the things I started with is knowing yourself and, and kind of getting to know yourself during this time and I've had to make decisions like that too and I like to weigh all of the the pros and cons and I get stuck in that decision making circle <laughs> that we can find ourselves in and I think the more that we know ourselves and how we cope and adapt and know our values that can be a really great way to spend some time if you have time to decide on five or ten values that are important to you. There's so much information that's free on the web just by doing a Google search. And having that value list of what you really hold near and dear to you um, can help when you have to start making some tough decisions. And I think there's going to be a transition when we go back to the workplace and you know, we resume a more, you know, kind of typical day uh, that we're going to see maybe some grief or maybe some difficult decisions that we didn't expect. And so I think even planning for the, the longer term transition, there's going to be another transition back to our, um, you know, our kind of typical routine. So I think those are some good things that they can start to work on. And that self-care menu, I think, will be a great resource in that same vein. <laughs> Way to go, Abby. You just segued us to the next talk, which is the last of the Let's Talks for, for now. Uh, bouncing back from quarantine. So next time we'll be talking about how do we get back to our lives? How do we handle that transition when we're going back to work? Some of us have already been called back and some of us will be called back in the next month or two, probably. So we'll talk about that next time. So, and that's it for today. Thank you so much for being here, Abby. I really appreciate it. Thank you all for joining us and finding out. I hope y'all got some good tips today and I look forward to seeing y'all next time. And I'll be doing more webinars, so you'll see me again, but um, we don't know exactly what those would be. So <laughs> I'll see y'all next week, and uh, y'all have a good one.